Hello, I'm Gary Johnston, a senior software engineer and SOA Tools Architect in the Rational Software Architect Development Organization at IBM. This is part one of a two-part series in which I'll show you some of the ways that Rational Software Architect 8.0 supports business process modeling and service-oriented architecture design from start to finish. First, some context. As you probably know, IT application and system development organizations must continue to become more and more flexible and nimble, and must more closely align their priorities with those of the business. SOA is a proven, best practices approach to meeting these challenges. Rational Software Architect 8.0 provides improved, better integrated, collaborative, end-to-end -end support for doing smarter SOA design and development. Rational Software Architect 8.0 includes Rational SOMA 2.9, which provides comprehensive SOA development process documentation and guidance based on best practices distilled from years of customer engagement experience. We've made significant improvements to the business process modeling editor and tools and have improved the integration between business process modeling and services modeling. We've made it easier to design and model the use of existing services, possibly external ones. We've improved the integration between services modeling and the deployment planning and modeling tools. The Rational Collaboration Capability Beta adds browser-based model review and feedback, and we now support simulated model execution. The rest of this video will show you most of this. Consider the following scenario. A hypothetical business currently ships products itself. To reduce delivery times, the business has decided to use an external shipping service, one that provides a web service for requesting pickup, that will let them better automate their shipping. Also, they suspect that they have a communication bottleneck between their order processing and accounting systems which are at separate locations. They want IT to investigate and propose a solution. At a high level, here's what I'll show you. I'll start with our existing business process and services models. Then I'll change the business process to indicate the use of an external shipping service. Next, I'll incorporate the use of this new service into our services model. I'll then create a model of how our services are deployed to our several physical locations. Next, I'll have a colleague review our models remotely via his web browser. From the review feedback, I'll decide to run a simulation of our model to check for bottlenecks. Finally, on the basis of our simulation results, I'll make a change to our deployment topology. The rest of this video will show you this. First, we open our current business process model in the BPMN Business Process Editor. As you can see, it has three lanes and a very straightforward flow. Each service task specifies an operation that will be invoked to automate it. If we want details, we can bring up its properties. We can click the operation's name to get to the properties of the operation itself. We can get to any page or tab of the properties. We can also find the operation in the Project Explorer. In Rational Software Architect 8.0, the target operation can be in a UML interface, as is the case here. Next, let's look at our services model. We start with our capabilities. These are UML SOML elements which bridge the abstraction gap between our high-level business process and our more IT detail-oriented services model. Each capability was automatically created with a reference to the business process model element from which it was originally derived, to which we can easily navigate. The next level of refinement in our services model is our service interfaces. A service interface more concretely represents what operations a service will provide, what the service requires to do its job, and other constraints that a consumer or a provider of the service must adhere to for the service to be used successfully. For example, there may be constraints on the order in which operations may be invoked. Some of our service interfaces are simple UML interfaces, while others are classes that provide and possibly require other interfaces. We maintain traceability to our capabilities via exposed relationships. One way to specify the responsibilities of the providers and consumers of a service is to define a service contract. We have three service contracts in our services model, two of which contain a sequence diagram to show the order in which the operations must be performed. We have created participants to represent the components that will implement the services. A participant may also require other services to do its job. 
so a participant may be a service provider, consumer, or both. Participants expose the services they provide and require via service and request ports, respectively. Each port's type is a service interface, indicating which service it provides or consumes. Here we have shown how our participants are to be wired together. We have also defined an overall sequence to the ordering process that our services support. This is good for communicating the required flow very concisely and unambiguously, of course, but we'll also use it later to help us plan our deployment. Finally, we have a services architecture, which we use to tie the participants together, showing how each one plays its role in our service contracts. Now we want to modify our business process by adding the use of an external shipping carrier. The carrier provides a web service that will allow us to automate the step of requesting pickup of a filled order that is to be shipped out. We will replace our current manual task with a service task that represents the new carrier service we'll use. Next, we'll add a capability to initially represent it in our services model. We don't really need to do this because the service itself already exists, but we do it anyway for consistency and for traceability linkage. The service modeling tool service palette provides an easy way to create a new capability from a BPMN element, including automatically creating traceability links. It creates the capability named after the selected BPMN element and creates operations derived from it as well. We change the operation's name to conform to our IT naming standards. We also capture this new usage dependency. Let's verify that the traceability linkage was created for us. The new carrier provided us with the WSDL that describes their web service. So we'll import that and transform it into the UML elements we'll need to incorporate into our services model. Let's take a look at it before we transform it. Now we create a WSDL to UML transformation and run it. We'll create a new model as the target of the transformation because we want to keep it separate from our main services model.
After applying a couple of SOA ML stereotypes that we want, the transformed WSDL looks like this. We create a simple diagram to show the relevant elements as SOA ML and the relationships between them. The capability is the one we derived from the new business process model task earlier. Then we'll tidy it up a bit. We've colored the capability differently to make the distinction that it's from a different model, our main services model. Now we can specify that the new service task in our business process model will use the carrier's web service. To do that, we select the task and set its operation to the request pickup operation in the service interface, carrier service, the one we just created from the carrier's WSDL. Let's verify that we selected the correct operation. Next, we'll incorporate the new carrier participant into our participants diagram. We just drag it in and tidy up its appearance a bit. We add a request port to our shipping participant to indicate that it will now use the carrier service. Then we'll tidy up a bit more, coloring the new participant differently to indicate that it came from a different model. Finally, we'll incorporate the new carrier participant into our overall operation sequence diagram. This completes the changes we want to make to our business process and services models. That's it for part one. In part two, we'll continue by planning the deployment of our services.